Okay, so now we're going to start uh, the first one, talk about sequence analysis. If you want to analyze the sequence, so you can actually analyze sequence of what? We can analyze the sequence of the primary structures of different proteins, when you compare the proteins. And also we can actually talk about the sequence of the nucleotides of a particular gene. Let's say for example, hemoglobin genes, okay? Later, I'm going to use the hemoglobin genes as one of the, the organism. Um, model eh, for us to study. So one of the systems that we can do this sequence analysis actually is called BLAST. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tools. So this what this BLAST can do for us. This BLAST actually basically can help us to find the similarity between the sequence that we want to study. Okay, for example, if we know that, okay, the particular genes that cause a disease, let's say for example, cause cancer in human, right? Okay, and then you want to study the particular gene. So you cannot use a human sample, you want to use an animal sample, but which animal you want to use or which organism you want to use, right? So that's why we can actually blast and find the similarity between the sequence. So the blast can help us to find the similarities. Okay, later I will show you how we can use this to find the similarity, how many percent of similarities. Then we can actually compare it with the other known genome. Okay, this blast system can help us to do similarities and then we can actually look at what are the organisms that we can use. Okay? For example, we can compare with the fruit fry, flies, okay, nematode worm, malaria parasites. Those are the possible for us to actually check and then we can study. Okay, so human genes such as those are concerned in development we found in other organisms Let's say, for example, Drosophila, the fruit fly. So it's a very useful model for us to investigate a such genes, okay? So, and this sequence alignment is a way for arranging a sequence of DNA and nucleotides, okay? A sequence of the nucleotides, you know, sequence of DNA, sorry, sequence of nucleotides. Please change the note, sorry. Sequence of nucleotides identify the region of the similarities. And it may give us the mismatch or the gap. Gap actually uh, indicates the insertions and deletions mutations. Okay, substitution, it gives us the mismatch. Okay, so you can see that in this diagram, you can see in these diagrams, okay, the first one is 100% match. So it won't give me any problem. So you tell me, okay, 100% match. Out of 60 nucleotides, 60 match. Can you see that? Or match. But if let's say that is a mismatch, you can see that, okay, T and G. Okay, if you use a humans, then you have to read one by one. Oh, G, G, T, T, G, G, and, and so on. So, and human may tend to make the error, but bioinformatics too, in this case, BLAST won't make the error. So, therefore, you can see that, oops, uh, there is a mutation take place. So, what kind of mutation? Base substitute. Oh, 60, 59 actually match. Okay. If there is any, okay, in this case, Curie 1, Curie 1 means it is your sequence. Subjects, in this case, basically means that the sequence in the system. So if there is a deletion, can I see that? So it put it as a gap, right? Deletions. So one nucleotide deleted, for example. So if we're using this, um, the blast system, they can tell us that, for example, okay, later I will show you. For example, I found a sequence of DNA, a piece of DNA. I sequenced out the DNA already. I got the sequence already of the, the, the nucleotides. What we can do, okay? So I'm going to off the share screen and stop record here for a while. Okay, now you can see that in this uh, website, so I have this BLAST system. Okay, it's a basic local alignment search tool called BLAST. So commonly we talk about, right? we, call, we call it as a BLAST system. And in this BLAST system, then we have both. We can BLAST the nucleotide sequence that we have, or we can BLAST the protein sequence, uh, uh, the sequence, this uh, amino acid sequence, okay, a particular protein. Let's say, for example, I have a sequence that I carry out the gene sequencing by a new, I mean, some, some animals or some organism that I haven't seen it before. So what I'm going to do, I can press on this nucleotide blast. Let's say, for example, I got a blood sample. I do not know uh, this blood sample belongs to what. Okay, I got the, the genes, okay, for example. Okay, so in this case, I can enter the sequence that I have. I mean, so I use the gene sequencing. I have done. So, okay, let's say, for example, this is a sequence that I have. Okay, I put it in. And then I can go through and then, okay, uh, depends on what you want to do. This is a bit com complicated. I'm going to uh, ignore this part and then I'm going to, okay, blast it. Okay, so it blasts, it may take about two or three seconds here. Okay, now it come up with this. So it gives us a list. 
can I see that? It gives us a list of the data uh, in the database. Show me how many cover 100% of these. You can see that's a lot. So some of the current and then like eh, eh, it's orang utan. Can I see if you compare? So you can see that there's a sequence that I do not know, right? The sequence I do not know. Correct. Okay, so I put it, oh, it belongs to humans. So in this case, 100% match. Okay, homo sapien hemoglobin subunit delta in this case. Okay, or beta. Okay, so now what I'm going to do here is I click it. When I click in, you can see that, okay, so how many percent match? Okay, out of 111 nucleotide, all match here. Can you see that? All match. So it means that it's not new species. This, uh, it belongs to the homo sapiens, mean human. So this sample belongs to humans. Okay, can you see that? So if let's say, okay, I go back. If let's say in this case, I had tri-nucleotide deletions, okay, tri or, or, okay, one nucleotide, I, I change it, okay, let's say for example, I change to A, okay, CAG, I change to A, okay, so again, I blast it. Okay, it still match with the humans, homo sapiens, human hemoglobin subunit. But now, can you see that there is a mismatch? Can you see that in this part, A and T, right? So what I put is A, the correct one is T. So I know that this, the mutation actually take place. What kind of mutation? This is the base substitution. So 99% match in this case. Can you see that? Oh, 111 only match with 110. Can you see that? Okay. So if let's say try nucleotide deletions, let's say for example, Okay, I delete trinucleotides, okay, deletions. Okay, so I blast it. Okay, it's still matched with the homo sapiens, but now it's 97.38%, okay, uh, okay, 97% match. Can I see that? It's a three nucleotide deleted. If I add three nucleotide, then you can see a dash will come up from the subject there. So you can see in this case, I do not need, this is a very simple, only 111 nucleotides. If let's say how many kilo base pair, then how are we going to compare one by one? You cannot compare one by one. A thousand, let's say for example, 1000 base pair, enough for you to compare already. And we actually have this blast system help me, okay, to do this. Are you clear? And in this case, I also want to introduce another uh, database, not in our, I mean, my notes, it's basically, it's called NCBI gene. So this NCBI gene, I can actually search for any kind of genes that you want to study. For example, in one of cancer genes or hemoglobins, I can actually press it in. Okay, I click it in. Then you can see that it gives us the sequence of the nucleotides. Can you see that a lot of information? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I can go and choose here and then I can put a sequence text view so I can see the sequence here. Can you see that? So it's not all. Some of the sequence actually is a junk sequence that we don't use it to code. Okay? So what we call it as the introns. Can you see that? The intron. That's why I don't code for any amino acid. But can you see that from start from here? Uh, the red color or this bit, uh, okay, this red color, they are the coding regions. Can you see that? The coding region. And you have a non-coding region, green color, and then coding region again. Can you see that? So during the mRNA formations, then this green color non-coding regions will be removed. And then those coding regions, can you see that? The first coding region and the second coding regions will splice together. Now, why I know that this orange color or this red color is the coding regions, Maybe I can enlarge it. Okay, how we know? Because now A, T, G, G, T, it can give us the amino acid. Can you see that the alphabet right? represent the amino acid? So from here, I can search for any kind of gene. Can you see that? So it's spliced together. Can I see that these are the non-coding regions? Okay, non-coding regions. Can you see that? So we have to remove. If we include those inside, then you give us the wrong Amino, right? wrong amino acid sequence already. So that's why in the gene tag, we do not, eh? in gene tag, we do not straight away take the DNA and then we cut it out, uh, I mean, or using a digestion enzyme, and then we insert it into the plasmid because it contains the non-coding region. So why we need to do? 
what we need to do, we have to use the mRNA, convert the mRNA to see DNA. So now you can see that actually a lot of this junk DNA in between that we need to remove it. Can you see that? Are you clear? Okay, uh, so this is another database is called uh, NCBI gene, where you can search for any kind of gene in this. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay, so what is this actually? What is this uh, apps or this uh, software can help us? Basically, we use it for the drug discovery. A drug discovery. So molecular docking or theoretical model is a key tool in a structural molecular biology and computer assisted drug design. So we, we integrate both together. Now, very important thing here is like we use a microarray, okay, to study which gene is expressed. Okay, from this uh, new, uh, we know that, oh yeah, we look at these uh, genes, okay, expressed already, this protein. Okay, this protein causes a certain disease. Now we want to think whether we can have any uh, uh, drugs, okay, or any possible uh, molecules that can actually inhibit this particular protein or not. So if we can inhibit this particular protein, maybe we can cure a particular disease. Can I say that? But we do know that without this molecular docking software, what we're going to have here is we're going to shoot. And we're going to carry out this uh, the, the shooting in the dark. So we're basically, we're going to blindly try all the chemicals that we have in this world. That is going to take time, it's going to cost us a lot. So what this molecular docking we can do is, it will help us to predict the ligand protein docking. Docking basically means binding in this case. Okay, We want to look at ligand means the chemical and protein binding. And it gives us the data in such a way that how good or how, how what we call the affinity between the affinity of the protein for the particular um, ligand. Okay, so successful docking methods search for high dimensional spaces effectively and use a scoring function that correctly rank the candidate. So it will give us, okay, out of millions or trillions of the possible candidates, then it will give us the it will shortlist the 10 and rank them, okay? So compared with traditional experimental high throughput screening, high throughput screening basically means that we take thousands of the, the chemical and we try on the cells, okay? Which is incurred a lot of cost. It will going to cost the, the, the time and make the, this drug discovery become slower, okay? But the thing here is the molecular docking can help us to predict Okay, the interaction between the small molecules and the protein, even at the atomic level, which allow us to characterize the behavior of small molecules in the binding site of targets proteins. So if you look at this diagram, so both of them, they are estrogen receptor alpha, right? estrogen receptor alpha, and we have two kinds of drugs, HNS9 and H. So HNS9 and NHS10. So I do not know what kind of drug, but basically they try it out. You can see that the different binding. So you can show you this uh, the molecule, the different molecule. Can you see that? The different molecule, how they bind. So if you look at this part, you can see that the green color indicates the binding of the molecule to the leucine and the trionids in this case. But here you can see that the binding only to the leucine. Can you see that? And then look at this structure here. That if they the binding, so each dotted line here indicate the different interactions, and from here we will be able to know whether this drug can bind uh, the the binding affinity. So from binding affinity, then we know that the how good or uh, how I mean the drug, how effective the drugs can inhibit our uh, protein of interest. So both of them, they are same protein A and B, but we use a different chemical. So this one I can't show you the the. We got this. Uh, the software we use is called Swiss Doc, and it's uh, not mistaken. You need to pay, okay, to get the service here, okay. So what are the, uh, highlight this question? Come out in the exam before. Again, okay, we talk about what is the advantages. Uh, sorry, what are the advantages and disadvantages of molecular docking? Okay, suggest uh, advantage. Carlo, suggests advantages of using the theoretical modeling in a pharmaceutical and drug research rather than testing possible drugs in the in the lab. So first of all, we know that molecular docking provide a fast it was faster. Okay, faster uh discovery 
of possible drugs, okay, candidates. So the interactions, okay, the interaction between the target protein and many different drugs can be tested in this molecular docking software in a short period of time. So again, very fast, okay? And because you don't need to carry out an experiment, you just go through, okay, you can blast it in. Even though it's a short, short period of time, it doesn't mean a few seconds we can get the result because you have to screen through, right? All, all the molecule in the database, you can click, I mean, so, okay, now what kind of molecule you want to choose, okay? What kind of the uh, functional groups, okay? And then the structure of possible candidate or drug can be modified. If let's say the binding of, eh, let's say for example, this is my molecule. Okay, let's say my molecule with OH. So, but the binding affinity, let's say it's not so good. Perhaps maybe, is it possible for us to actually change the structure from, okay? Remove the OH, maybe we add in the CH3, for example. And we're going to look at our CH3OH, for example. Uh, CH2OH, it's going to be CH3OH. Okay, instead of this, we add in the, let's say for example, CH2OH. Maybe the binding affinity better. But the problem here is, if you use a conventional lab animal or lab testing, once you edit already, then what we're going to do? You have to test it on animal. So you repeat a new cycle again and you won't know that whether success rate is high or not. But molecular docking can help us. We can actually change, modify the drug. This is a particularly very, very important in the antibiotic resistance strain. Because current antibiotic has no effect to a particular kind of the bacterial, what we're going to do, we basically can actually slightly modify the drugs and then we try it out in the system and we see whether it can increase the efficacy or not, increase the binding affinity or not. Okay, And we do know that there is no need to use a laboratory consumable and the equipment in the molecular docking. Therefore, the process is more economics as compared to the high throughput screening or random testing of drugs on animal model. And last, also there's no ethical issue arise when molecular docking is performed. Because people always say that, oh, it's animal cruelty. In this case, you use animal to try out and you use human to try out, right? So cruelty. But in this case, by using the molecular docking, you can reduce the number of the animal use. Because we do know that this molecular docking cannot totally substitute or replace the animal model or even the human. We have to go through again, but we reduce. If we try it, I mean, it's a randomly, and it's shooting the, I mean, in the dark in this case, and blindly try, then what will happen, you can use up a lot of animal, right? But in this case, we can actually shortlist, right? we can shortlist, for example, 10 candidates, and we only try these 10 candidates or this uh, molecule on the animal. But can it replace? The answer is no. Why it cannot uh, replace? Because there are some limitation here. So what is the uh, limitation? So functionality and the efficiency of the new drug, you still have to try it in the laboratory animal and clinically. Clinically, we use means that on human. So what we test? We test a few things. We test for pharmacokinetics. So what means pharmacokinetics? Pharmacokinetics basically is how the drug okay, uh, uh, metabolize in the liver. Sometimes because our, uh, you know, our liver will have certain enzyme may change the drug. Right? So let's say for example, the drug, the OH group, but when it enter into the liver, maybe the liver uh, detoxification process, the enzyme, and eh? uh, detoxification enzyme in this case may change the OH group to CH2, CH3. Then the drug will be totally lost the efficacy. Means that no, uh, no effect at all, okay? And we also want to know the pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics is basically how the mode of mechanism of the new drug, how the drug binds the receptor, for example, in the molecular uh, docking, you only know, oh, they bind the receptor. But what is the effect of the binding to the receptor? Then we have to use the animal model to study, okay? And also we want to know what we call the therapeutic windows. Therapeutic window basically means that we want to know what is the safe dose that gives us the effect. So we call effective dose. What's the minimum dose the effect? I mean, I'll give us the effect. And what is the highest dose I can use? Because above this level or beyond this level, you're going to give us the lethal effects, means it will kill us. So this we call as a therapeutic window. And this thing cannot be predicted, cannot be uh, known by using the molecular uh, docking. As well as the bioavailability, okay, when you take it orally, for example, certain drug, when you take it 100 milligram, but doesn't mean that 100 milligram will be absorbed. 
Okay, so this is called bioavailability. Okay, means that how much will be absorbed and available in your blood. And what it means, another one is biodistribution. Biodistribution means that can this drug deliver or transport by your blood into a particular organs or not? For example, if let's say anti-cancer drug that have to kill the breast cancer cell but cannot reach the breast, then useless, right? So these are the things that you won't be able to predict by using the theoretical modeling, okay? Now, those terms, if you, I mean, in future, when you study a medical program, you study pharmacies, okay, pharmacy, dentist, uh, dentistry, then this term you're going to, I mean, uh, because you're going to uh, learn them again. So now, if you forget about those terms, doesn't matter, just put it as, you can describe it in your own way. Are you clear? So I'll give you those terms. Those terms uh, belong to the pharmacology terms, okay? So those terms, you will be learning when you study pharmacology. And also the side effect and adverse effect of the new drug can only be determined by using the animal model or clinically, okay? Because we do not know the side effect, adverse effect at all if you use this molecular uh, docking process, okay? So now, the last part we're going to look at this is the phylogenetic analysis. Phylogenetic analysis basically means family tree. How close? Again, we talk about, okay, one organism evolved and speciation take place, but when? How close they are, okay? So we can study these relationships, okay, by using a software, okay? So this phylogeny is shown by an evolutionary history using a relationship found by comparing the macromolecules such as RNA, DNA, or even the protein of various organisms. And what we're going to do here is we can use a blast system to check for the similarity of this macromolecule. So based on the assumption that similarity of the sequence result having the fewer evolutionary divergent. So means that what we actually look at is if DNA, we do know that, no, try to imagine, sir. this is ancestral DNA. So if let's say they are separated, reproductively isolated, for example, become two subpopulation and they still inherit the same piece of DNA, but because of the random mutation that take place, random mutation that take place. Can you see that? So then these random mutations, you can see that this part and this part won't be the same and we can use it to compare. If let's say the similarity is very, very high, then we know that they share the the uh, common ancestor recently. But if let's say they have a lot, a lot of mutation, the similarity is so far uh, away, I uh, mean, so they're so huge in terms of divergent, then we know that they share the, the, the common ancestor less recently. So from here, we can plot what we call the phylogenetic tree. So if you look at what it mean the phylogenetic tree, you can see that in this case, you will be able to see the Homo sapiens compared to the chimpanzee, gorilla, and then and look, uh, limo. So those are the things that we can use the, this uh, mutation rate. Okay, we can use this mutation rate and try to match it with a fossil record, try to calibrate it by using fossil record. We will be able to know how far we are from each other. So for example, 6 million years ago, that is where the reproductive isolation take place between the ch uh, chimpanzee and the homo sapien, roughly about 6 million years ago, based on the molecular uh, clock uh, hypothesis here. Okay, I'm going to talk about my molecular clock hypothesis later. Okay, so we can compare the amino acid sequence of the proteins. So in this, uh, so in the exam, they may give you this piece of information and you need to make a conclusion, okay? So for example, in this case, changing a single amino acid in the primary structure of protein may cause a dramatic change in the structure and a function. But sometimes many proteins, small changes in the amino acid sequence leave the overall structure and the function of protein unaltered. How? There are two ways, two ways. Eh? So mutation take place, mutation always take place. But the effect, it depends. So these two possible effects of the mutation. First, the mutation takes place at the regions where the proteins, okay, it would affect the functionality of the protein. So how? Basically, if this is the protein, the enzyme, let's say, for example, uh, this is the active site. But the mutation caused the change of the amino acid actually away from the 
active site. So it means that this enzyme still can function, no problem. Are you clear? Or number two, they may replace the particular amino acid based substitution and replace the particular uh, amino acid with the same type. Let's say, for example, the interaction between these two amino acids, the R group, is a C O O minus. Are you clear? With the NH3 positive, the R group. So this is what we learned. This is the acidic R group. So because of the mutation, they still give us this, the same R type of R group. Are you clear? Let's say, for example, glutamic acid change to aspartic acid. So both are density acid. So it means that it won't cause much different in terms of the functions. Okay. So we uh, in this case, cytochrome C, okay, cytochrome C is from the mitochondria. So when a sequence of cytochrome C from human, mice, and rat was compared, were compared, it was found out that all three molecules consist the same number of amino acids. Cytochrome C of human, cytochrome C of mice, cytochrome C of the rat give us the same. Okay, number of amino acids. The sequence of mouse and rat cytochrome C, they are identical. Nine amino acids in human cytochrome C are different from the mouse or rat sequence. So most of these substitutions in the human cytochrome C are the amino acids with the same types of the R group, as I say that. Okay. But the sequence of cytochrome C from other species such as fruit flies, nematode worm, and also uh, and are also examined, the number of difference from human sequence increases. So what are the conclusions here? So basically, in the conclusion, we want to talk about whether how close they are. So the comparison suggests that the mice and rat are closely related. They are not the same species, but closely related because why? We only check for this cytochrome C. Are you clear? Okay, uh, so happen to cytochrome C same, but how about other uh, proteins, right? So we see that they are closely related species sharing a reason common ancestor. And you compare to humans, we are more distantly related, sharing a common ancestor with the mice and rat less recently. So it means mouse and rats, they share recently, but humans will be a bit distant away. Okay. But if you compare, because a huge difference between the fruit flies, the matted worm, then what we conclusion? However, humans are less closely related to the fruit flies and the matted worm. Because why? The differences. So always remember, when differences is high, means that less recently related. Are you clear? Less recently related or less closely related. Why? Because the mutations, you, and I mean, uh, uh, common sense, right? If we apart for longer times, means that more mutation will take place, differences will be high, right? percentage. We can convert the percentage of differences, then definitely percentage of differences will be higher. Okay, so this one we compare. We compare what? Amino acid sequence. We also can compare the nucleotide sequence of the mitochondria DNA. So why mitochondria DNA? I will explain it later. Why you don't choose a, a nucleus DNA, but we choose a mitochondria DNA later, I will tell you. So now, analysis okay, of mitochondria DNA of a different species of NO lizards that are found throughout the Caribbean and also the adjacent mainlands provide evidence of their relationship. So in this case, we want to know how the speciation actually take place. Okay, We have four different kinds or the four different species. We have Anolis carolidensis, Anolis brunius, Anolis samarignus, and Anolis procatus. So we have carolidensis, brunius, samarignus, and procatus. We want to know okay, how they spread to this island. Is it? A series of events that move like this, or they move like this, or how they move, how they migrate. Okay, so based on the molecular clock hypothesis, the longer the okay, molecular clock hypothesis, the longer we distance apart, then the higher the percentage of the difference. Why? Because mutations take place in a very constant rate. This is assumption. We assume that mutation takes place at a very constant rate. So means that it becomes, when we talk about the rate, means that we can convert it into time, right? So we do know that if two species, they, the, the percentage of the different is high, basically means that they, they are separated 
even more or even longer times with, uh, compared to those with a higher similarity. Okay. Now, this one, actually, uh, I forgot to put it in. The table it, it is show us the percentage of difference. Okay, percentage of difference, not percentage of similarity. Okay, it cannot be percentage of similarity because too low. Are you clear? It's only 12.1 similar. Okay, but they, they, if they're 12.1% similar, means that they cannot be the same uh, uh, genus anymore. Are you clear? Okay, it cannot be same family. Okay, uh, so now look at this diagram. How we analyze it? This is a past year paper actually come up before. Okay, so we compare. Now we want to know Table 16.15 should the result comparing uh, parts of the mitochondrial DNA of four of the species and it show percentage of differences. Okay. Uh? Now, the researcher also suggests that the initial anal lizard population is originated from Cuba. So it means that it start from here, from Cuba. Then we want to see how they actually migrate. Okay, how they move because they, when they move to the different island, they have a new different uh, mutation, but because they are reproductively isolated, therefore they develop the speciation actually take place. But what we want to know that this speciation definitely is an allopatric speciation because separated by the geographical uh, region or geographical barrier. But now we want to know how it moves. So how we actually I mean, analyze here. So we talk about this first, uh, okay? We have Procatus and Brunius. So, okay, Procatus and Brunius. Procatus and Brunius, yes, eh, differences is 11.3. So I jot down 11.3. Procatus and Samarinus. Procatus and Samarinus, 8.9. Okay, Caronensis, 13.2%. Okay, Samaraninus and Brunius, 12.1. Okay, and then uh, Karenensis and Brunius, Karenensis and Brunius, 16.7. Samaraninus and also uh, Karenensis here. Okay, now uh, 15.0. So from this diagram, so what is the migration pathway? Okay. So if let's say, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, if the migration start here from Procatus Cuba, move to the Florida, and then move to Andros, and then Eclic, if let's say movement this way, uh, okay, I use a uh, blue color to show you if the movement is this way. Make sense or not? Make sense or not? It does, it does not, eh, it's, it, it, it does not make sense. Eh? Why? Because if you look at it, if you move this way uh, from Cuba to Florida, Florida to Andros, Andros to Eklin, means that percentage of difference cannot be 8.9 only. It'll be higher, 13.2. Okay, 16.7, for example, 16.7, and then another one. So it means that you top up all the differences here, it, might, it will have to be higher. So it cannot be this way already. It cannot. The first way, the first predicted or hypothesis cannot work. Because why? If they move this way, means that Samarinus and the Procatus must show even higher in terms of percentage of difference. Correct not? It may be 20 something, 30 something percent different. Correct not? Okay? Because further away, right? This, let's say that a speciation take about 10 years, let's say, for example, another 10 years, another 10 years. So means that so many years already, it must have a very, very diverge in terms of their gene pool. So it cannot be 8.9 only. So cannot. Then if I move it this way, is it possible? Okay. Uh, because everything from Cuba, ma. can it move this way? Okay. Right. Okay. 8.9 seems okay. Okay. Then 12.1. Now, if we move this way, and then we realize that hey, 8.9, 12.1, it should be... This one cannot be 11.3 because if move this way, okay, from Eklin to the Enneus and, uh, sorry, uh, Andros and then Florida, it will top up. So it cannot be 13.2 only. So again, this route is impossible. Okay, can it be go to the Andros first and then move? So if go to Andros first and then move to the Florida, cannot also. 11.3, 16.7, I expect this one will be higher. 
it might be 20. If let's say from here, move to Andros and then move to Eklins here, it cannot be 8.9. So the only possible explanations here will be three different timing. Three different timing. So it means that it's a three different allopatric speciation take place. So when they migrate, are you clear? Okay, so it means that first from Cuba to the, you look at percentage of difference according to molecular clock. If the percentage difference is higher, basically they separated earlier, right? So it means that the first allopatric speciation take place where the anolis, eh, the, the anolis procactus, they migrate to the Florida and then they found and, and they set up a new populations here. Do you realize that? When they move here, they set up a new population. And because they are isolated, reproductive isolated, therefore, they form a new species. And why 13.2 compared to 11.3 and 8.9? Then we do know that, we do know that actually, this is the first time, I mean, they are separated. So maybe, I mean, a few hundred years later, you can see that another group migrates to the Andros Islands and then start and eh, following by means, okay, later another group go to Eklins and then they are separated, they are reproductive isolated, therefore they form another three new species. So based on this similarity, we can actually try to figure out how the speciation actually take place, right? how the migrations, okay, how the migration uh, do take place. It's not like this, it's not this way, it's not like this, okay? No matter how you move, the data show us it's a three, okay? Different events, okay? Allopatric speciations events, okay? Huh? So what are the conclusions? Okay, we reference to the finding, make a conclusion. So we know that this result showed that the three species of analysts Okay, uh, Brunius, Sarinus, and Carinensis are more closely related to Procactus, right? You can see that no matter how, they are closely related to the Procactus rather than others, okay? So, hence, this finding suggests that these species have each originated from a separate event in which a few individual of the Procactus spread from Cuba to the three different places at three different timings. The mitochondrial DNA suggests that the allopatric speciation has occurred, right? We compare these allopatric. Why allopatric, not sympatric? Because they are, they have this, what we call a geographical barrier. Okay, the speciation take place. Okay. Huh? So different in the nucleotide sequence of the mitochondrial DNA can be used to study the origins and the spread of the homo sapien. Now, be careful of the first one. Yeah, be careful of the first statement. This is in our syllabus. We say that human mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the female line. Okay, it's not like our embryo. Embryo actually inherited from both lines. You inherit from father and mother. So it means that it will give us more. Okay, it will give us more variation. But mitochondria only come from the female line. Okay, but now a day, now a day, actually the research also show that it can come from the male lines. Okay, uh? and a zygote contain mitochondria over, but not from the sperm. Okay, so therefore the uh, what whatever mitochondria according to this part of this piece of uh, information, the mitochondria that we have actually come from the ovum, not from the sperm, and the mitochondria they are circular. And they cannot any they cannot undergo any form of crossing over, and the changes in the nucleotide sequence can only arise by mutation. So it means that if we want to compare the DNA, we want to know because we use the rate of mutation as our molecular clocks. Are you clear? We use this uh, mutation rate. When you say the rate, then you can convert to time, right? How fast? Let's say for example, every ten years one mutation. Every 10 years, one mutation, let's say, for example, then we can actually calibrate, okay, the clock there. But the thing here is, if the changes, not only mutation, because of crossing over, okay, or independent assortments, then if more, it add-ons the, 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 the more, very, uh, what we call this, uh, the doubt in terms of our results, right? But mitochondrial DNA, why we choose it to use a mitochondrial DNA? Because 
any changes to the sequence of the nucleotide only can be uh, can, on, uh, can only be cause of the mutation, not crossing over. Okay, and also we will have more mitochondrial DNA sample compared to the nuclear because in the nucleus you only have two copies, right? It had from father and mother, but mitochondrial DNA in one cell we can have a lot of the mitochondria. Therefore, we can get more DNA for the analysis. Okay, but it's not really important, not really important because if not enough, we always can use a PCR to amplify them, right? Okay, so there's extra one point that we can add it. But the most important one actually is C because they are circular, they are lead, uh, circular, one copy only. So they don't go, they won't undergo any form of crossing over. So any changes is just because of the mutation. Okay, uh, so one good thing about this uh, molecular clock hypothesis we already done it for the humans and we know that's how human migrates to the different parts of the world. Okay, so different humans populations show difference in terms of mitochondrial DNA sequence because a mutation takes place, it won't be inherited to, I mean, unless they go back to the particular original population. If no, you won't see the, 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 the sharing of that particular gene pool. Okay, so this study have led to a suggestion that all modern humans, whatever race, are descended from one woman's core mitochondria if, okay, due to that particular uh, a female, the first one evolved, and then they pass on, okay? So this is called molecular clock hypothesis because we do know that, we do know that we can calibrate how many percent of uh, 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 mutation equivalent to how many years, okay? So from here, we know that every of us actually start from the Africa. From Africa, we migrate, okay? The humans migrate to Europe and then continue to the Asia. And then it's gonna see that still in terms of year. Okay, so that is something special here is, we do have, we do have a, a species, we claim a species of a human called Neanderthal that previously lived in, Okay, previously lived in the European country. Okay, what actually happened here is when we sequence the Neanderthals, uh, the gene, okay, sequence, and the humans in the Asians, then we realized that we do share about about 4%, not mistaken, 4% of the Neanderthals. But those population in the Africa won't have the Neanderthals uh, 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 sequence. Why? Because of migration. Migrations, okay, can you see the migrations? So that is the part where we share the common ancestor here. But those humans live in the Africa, they don't have that piece of information in terms of their DNA. Why? Because mutation take place somewhere here. So those in this part of the world or Africa, they won't receive that. So it means that from here, we can see the differences already, right? So these differences, we can actually call it as the molecular clock hypothesis. So the hypothesis saying that, assume that there is a constant rate of mutation over time, the greater our differences in the sequence of the nucleotide, the longer ago those individuals share a common ancestor. The clock can be calibrated by comparing nucleotide sequence of the species and we can use the fossil evidence to, to calibrate it. Are you clear? So it means that it's not a, a, a permanent one. Okay, for example, oh, every 1% of the mutation equivalent to 25,000 years. We cannot, I mean, uh, fix it like this because when we have a new discovery of the fossil record, then we're going to recalibrate this molecular clock again. Okay, so with this, I've done for the bioinformatics. Okay, before we go for this, I'm going to show you guys this phylogenetics, okay, um, analysis. Okay, I stopped. Uh, okay, so this is a phylot. Phylot is a tree generator. How close rate, closely related we are with the other species, we can actually use this NCBI uh, tree elements or called phylots. Okay, so we can search some of the animals here or, or organism here, but because this is a free version, okay, I don't register any account here. Okay, so it means that got the limited. So for example, we start with the humans. Okay, we type in the humans here. Okay, homo sapien. I want to compare humans with, let's say, okay, the dog. Sorry, no one started dog worse. Uh, because we are cross-related with the rats. 
Okay, second species rat. And then uh, we want to look at how close we are with the dog, right? For example. Okay. Then I can compare with the cats, for example. Okay. So cat and dog, they actually uh, share more reasons, okay, in terms of the phylogenetics. Now I want to compare with uh, a plant, let's say uh, the corn, the maize. We will study about the maize, right? Okay, you can compare with the maize. So I'm able to continue another one, normally five. Now I want to compare to plasmodium. Okay, you want to see, it means the malaria plasmodium. Okay, then maybe E. coli. Okay, e. coli. Okay, try to generate now. Huh? I forgot already how many they can. So we can generate, okay, the three. Okay, we are visualizing I told. Hopefully we can. So can you see that it show us, eh? It show us what? The gene, eh? This tree, okay? This tree. So you can see that how closely we are related it based on the branch. So humans and also the rat, okay? Human and the rat, we share more reasonably compared to the, these two. Can you see that? We share, for example, homo sapiens and humans, right? So humans and the rat, we share reasonably the common ancestor. This is where we actually branch out and speciation take place. But if you compare these canines, uh, canines lupus and the felis, so canines and the felis, this is the dog, this is the, uh, or the cat. They share more reasonably. But if you look at these two of them compared to humans, we share less reasonably if you compare humans and the rats here, but humans and also the cat. And you will compare to the plasmodium even further. Can you see that? Okay, compared to the zemes, further. If you compare to the bacteria E. coli, even more. Can you see that? So this will help us to actually do the analysis how closely we are compared to the other organism. So this is one of these, what we call the phylot, is the tree generator. So we can generate and we do know that when. Okay, and each dot actually got information. One. Can you see that? Okay. So every dot actually represent a timing when the, 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 the species. So it means that from each dot, actually we have to branch out one, but we didn't add it in here. Each dot, we have to branch out one, okay? But we didn't include those other species. So we, it's not shown here, okay? Are you clear? It's not like whole uh, human, so chimpanzee may be somewhere here. You get some other things come out from the dot. Are you clear? So how far away we actually uh, diverge okay or, or, or evolve from the ancestral species okay so now not only this i want to show you i want to show you another one also which is the protein so we can search the protein and this protein can you see that this is the quaternary protein you look at this this is the protein structure protein database so this protein database can be used eh, in the molecular docking. Eh, for example, we want to find any active site. I mean, this one is not active site because this is the hemoglobin. So if you look at this, we have the heme groups here. Heme group. So we have alpha, beta strains in this end, the, the, the polypeptide, eh, alpha and beta polypeptide. We can do the three-dimensional and the fine. So from here, I can see a lot of this alpha helix structure. So protein database. Okay. And then you can see that this okay, color, can you see that? It's a water molecule. So that's why we do know that hemoglobin, they are water-soluble, globular protein, because they can interact with the water molecule. Can you see that? The pink color. Then you can look at this, uh, uh, these regions. They will tell us, okay, water molecule. So they can interact by forming the hydrogen bond water molecule. If I click in these regions, can you see that? It will give us the ring. It's a profile ring. Basically, the heme group contains the Fe. Can you see that? Okay, at the, the windows there. So I can rotate and look at the structure. I can find out whether any uh, active site, binding site that can inhibit. Let's say this is the proteins that I want to study. I want to find inhibitors that can inhibit. So here we give us the predictions. Okay, so another one is this uh, OFR final. This is uh, something like you have a sequence. I don't want to translate my sequence into the amino acid sequence. I'm lazy, right? Okay, I don't want to, I mean, a, a translation may be wrong. So what we can do here is, 
we can actually insert the sequence. Can you see that? I can insert the sequence and then I can submit the sequence in this bioinformatic tools here. Then it will generate the sequence of the amino acid. This another one that's, again, I, don't, I didn't go into the detail. Can you see that they tell us? Methionines and blah, blah, blah. Can you see that? Okay, phenylalanines, analines, okay, thyroxines, lysine, arginines, okay. So it gives us the sequence of the amino acid. So this, you can see that how I mean, uh, uh, easier we can use these bioinformatic tools to help us to analyze the sequence and so on. Okay, so with this, I will stop recording. Done for today.